Good evening. Welcome to this MHPN webinar on the topic of grief, trauma and anxiety. This is brought to you uh, by MHPN, uh, which is an online professional networking platform designed to enhance and promote interdisciplinary mental health care across Australia. And tonight we have three outstanding speakers. We've arranged for you to hear from some of the brightest stars in the constellation of Australian trauma professionals. You are in for a real treat. So welcome everybody. Pour yourself an orange juice or a small glass of cardiovascular protection fluid and prepare to consume a veritable smorgasbord of blue ribbon expertise. The webinar is hosted, as I mentioned earlier, by MHPN. Some of you might not know this is a Commonwealth funded project supporting the development of this interdisciplinary collaboration in the local primary mental health sector across Australia. So we will have uh, all sorts of disciplines listening today. Uh, it's currently supported by 500 local uh, mental health networks and if you want more information on MHPN after this, just go to their website which is on your screen. On top of that, uh, today's learning objectives are really quite uh, straightforward. We're trying to give you some practical skills, some knowledge and some strategies which will enable you to identify mass personal and or various trauma in patients, in treatment teams and of course communities as a whole. We hope at the end of uh, today you will be able to recognise some of the principles of intervention and of course the roles of different disciplines in providing a staged response to trauma, including of course psychological first aid, psychological recovery and post-traumatic mental health conditions. The webinar will be comprised of two parts. We will have an interdisciplinary panel discussion, so it will be a bit different from other webinars which uh, focused on a case study. And then we'll have questions and answers which are fielded from the audience itself. And I look forward to reading those and passing them on. Now there are a couple of ground rules that we have to stick to. I'm going to moderate the panel discussion and uh, if you send some questions through to me, I'll pick the best ones. So please submit your questions for the panel just by typing them into the little message box to the right hand of your screen. And uh, if your specific question is not addressed or if you want to continue the discussion, you can do so in a post-webinar online forum on MHPN Online. Please make sure that your sound is on and your volume is turned up on your computer. And the webinar recording and the PowerPoint slides will all be posted on the website within 24 hours of the live activity. If you have problems during the webinar, please ring technical support on 1800 733 416. So according to the Australian Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health, up to 65% of Australians will experience a real or perceived threat to their life or safety or to their loved ones. Now this might be in the form of a car accident, an assault, a bushfire, a flood, a war or even a terrorist event. Almost anyone who goes through such a traumatic event will be affected. How organisations and health services respond to trauma can of course have a lasting impact on a person's ability to recover. Now thankfully most people recover on their own with the support of family and friends but others may develop mental health problems and will require more help. Their problems may include anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, risky alcohol and drug use, together with difficulties with relationships, work and daily life. But we believe that emotional recovery is imp as important as physical recovery if people are to go on to live fulfilling and productive lives. So to kick off tonight, we're going to hear from Janice Hinson. She's the Director of Social Work Services at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. She's recently returned to this role after a secondment to the Human Social Incident Management Team as Deployment Manager for Disaster Recovery for Queensland Health during the uh, summer floods and cyclones in Queensland. So she'll have plenty of uh, expertise. So uh, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. I hope everybody can hear me um, because my computer seems to be looking very strange. Can everybody hear me? 
I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Thanks. Well, I'll just continue, and if it drops out, uh, just let me know. We'll cope. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that terrific introduction. Um, I thought that I would start to the proceedings off tonight by doing a bit of a, a case study approach to what happened to us here. Um, and just to run through a few things and then very happy to take questions after that uh, as we go through the night. Well, look, I was tapped on the shoulder at New Year this year to come in off leave to secondment to what's called up here the Human Social Incident Management Team, which is part of the Queensland Health Disaster Management Response. And I was brought in um, originally as planning manager, but I realised from the first day that the need wasn't for this role, which is was very much more at a strategic level, but for a system in getting help out to affected communities. Now, Queensland Health had um, broader strategic systems in place and a well-defined partnership with other agencies such as the um, Queensland Police Service, Emergency Services and so on. But I felt that there was a great need for deployment systems down on the ground which actually weren't in place. Now I'm the chair of the Queensland Social Work and Welfare Leadership Group, so fortunately I was able to put out a call through my networks for uh, volunteer deployees because it was a really a systems approach that I felt we needed to take. I had a huge response from Queensland Health staff, so I started the process of setting up a database of these people, but they also needed approval from their line managers to participate. And let me tell you, it wasn't always easy to find out who the appropriate managers were. I had a lot of interesting conversations with a lot of different people over that time. But the hospitals were really extremely generous in releasing staff, often from departments which were uh, depleted of staff who were also affected by the floods. And then, of course, those left behind became even more stretched as they had to cover their colleagues. So it really was a system under, under difficulties. I don't have much time to tell you about the highs and lows of the process that we went through because I'd really like to focus on what we learned about mass disaster. But just to give you an example, we were located on the top floor of a building which was evacuated at the height of the flood, but unfortunately because the computer systems hadn't been set up for us at that stage, we didn't get the evacuation notice. Eventually we realised we needed to move uh, when the water started lapping up around the building. Um, so we did move and had to quickly find another home and were relocated to another hospital. But again, the phones and computers there weren't set up. And unfortunately, that was also the day I had a request for the first group of 21 deployees now they had to be located, approvals obtained from their hospitals, um, tetanus injections given, psychological first aid training provided, um, find how the sorts of transport that we would need to get them there because of course the roads were all out. And then we had to transport the group to the flood affected areas of Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley. Now I can tell you my mobile was running hot because I tried to set this system up um, and I had calls from all over Queensland. So every time I ended a call, there'd be six more messages for me re to return. And it was quite a frantic time with technical people working all around us, employees arriving, um, needing to be sent for their tetanus injections and so on and so on. So it was a pretty frantic day that day, but we did it and we did it on time. So I guess the, what are the lessons we learned? Well. The first is, don't expect your emergency officers to be set up. If you're involved in a mass disaster, the chances are that there may actually be some accommodation for you somewhere, but those rooms, even if they are specifically emergency rooms, won't have been used for quite some time. So computers won't be set up, phones won't be on, all that sort of thing. So you'll just have to cope until, that, um, until all of those systems are set up. And that can actually take some time. I mean, for instance, we didn't even have hot water where we were for a while, so we couldn't even make a coffee for ourselves, let alone for the employees who were coming in and out. However, once we got going, 
we had access to so many resources and for me, um, having worked in many organisations where resources were pretty stretched, that was just an absolutely wonderful experience. For instance, we couldn't get the first group out to um, all of the country areas they needed to go to. So what happened? We managed to get a Royal Flying Doctor Service helicopter. And I can tell you the deployees were pretty stoked about that because apparently the pilots were pretty cute. The next issue is that there's no one answer to fit all in a disaster and that you have to stage your responses. The next thing is that um, your first, um, the first thing you have to provide is psychological first aid. And we can talk a little bit about that and what the processes of psychological first aid are as you know, later on in the evening. Um, but I, I, there, I wanted to say a few things about it. And the first is that psychological first aid is not domain specific. Some people in Queensland Health originally felt that deployees should be only mental health staff. And I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this, but from day one, both the affected communities and the deployee team leaders that I dispatched up to those uh, communities were asking for social workers from acute areas and particularly from emergency departments and from community settings. And this is because there's a, there was a recognition on the ground that those workers are skilled in trauma management and in outreach to affected people. In fact, our data showed that we had a 60-40 split of social workers and nurses with approximately 70% of the social workers coming from the acute and community context. Um, our experience was, and again, I hope I'm not going to be offending anybody, but our experience was that some of the mental health staff struggled with outreach, um, instead seeing their responses being centred only in the recovery centres. And I have to say that those people were also criticised by their own, in, own mental health colleagues for this sort of approach. The best response was from those staff who took a first response approach of door knocking, doing things like handing out water as a way of approaching people, going to cattle sales, talking to farmers, finding out where the hangout spots were for the local community. Uh, for example, in one town it was the local laundromat, somewhere else it was a GP surgery or the pub. One group went to a James Blundell concert out in the bush and mingled with the audience. Or people just walked around the streets and talked to everybody that they could meet. Really, they just went wherever they could find people. And this is clearly a vital stage because it's one where people become engaged. In the medium and long term stages post the disaster, mental health services have a big part to play. But again, I have to say that's not for everybody because not everybody um, requires that, that level of assistance. Those medium and long term stages have also got to be respectful of the existing services in the communities, which will often have been working very hard to manage during the event. And they usually don't t take too kindly to external agencies coming in over the top of them post the disaster. And we have seen a couple of incidents of that sort of thing. And the next point is that we must recognise people's existing strengths and supports and how they're functioning at the time of the disaster. We saw some people who'd lost everything and immediately set about restoring their lives and others who lost much less but were dazed and helpless. I think the thing is that people come to a mass disaster such as a flood with all of their pre-existing issues and pre-existing ways of coping. So, key issues in disaster management. And I don't seem to be able to get my next slide coming up because I am having great problems here with the computer. It's up, it's okay. Is that okay? Good. Okay, so the key issues really are the importance of psychological first aid as basic care. And that really involves listening to people, providing practical assistance 
and listening and listening and keeping on listening. The second point is that I think we've got to recognise that most disaster responses are really a disaster in themselves because no matter how well we think we've organised things, things will always go wrong. And I think don't expect that the one disaster that you've been called up for might not evolve into another disaster. For example, the summer floods here merged into the devastating cyclones in, in North Queensland and then into the Christchurch earthquake for us. Um, the, then when the earthquake happened in Japan and all of the unrest was happening all over the, uh, all over the world, we all felt the world's going mad. And for us sitting in our little bunker, uh, we, every day we kept wondering what was going to hit us next. You've got to be aware of the well-being of people that you send out into affected areas. And I was really constantly concerned about their safety. The roads were very poor. People were walking through toxic mud. They were working long hours. Um, we, when it first started, we weren't even sure where they were going to be accommodated. And a lot of people turned up with sleeping bags because they thought they'd be sleeping out in the field somewhere. But in fact, we were very lucky and we were able to put people into motels. And the people in South East Queensland were actually quite lucky um, because they had um, um, good accommodation, they had air conditioners and that sort of thing. Poor old uh, groups that we sent up to North Queensland, however, just post the cyclone, of course the electricity wasn't on. And some of their motels had generators, but they went off at 11 o'clock at night. So our people had been working since about 7 o'clock in the morning through until 7 or 8 o'clock at night through you know, that terrible heat and humidity that you get around cyclone season. Dropped into bed for a couple of hours sleep. Once the generators went off, of course, it was really hot again and they couldn't sleep. So by the time they got back to um, their home base, they were really pretty spaced out from um, their, their experiences there. Um, okay, in terms of the process that we used in deploying people, um, I established a process of a briefing here with us before they left, putting a Queensland Health team leader into the community um, so that those people had somebody locally that they could um, you know, con have contact with, and then close contact in the field. Uh, that wasn't always possible because we didn't always have mobile reception. So sometimes it was pretty scary thinking what's happening to our people when we couldn't get hold of them. And then when they came back um, uh, through Brisbane or wherever they, whichever town they were coming through, we did a debriefing on their return. Um, we tr liked to do a group debriefing, um, but that wasn't always possible, for instance, we, uh, particularly after the cyclones, deployed people from oh, Weeper, you know, all over the place. So obviously they couldn't come to Brisbane for a debrief, so it used to be a one-on-one -on -one over the phone. Deployees were also given employee assistance contacts in case they wanted to debrief further or they were particularly stressed about things that they'd seen. Um, and we made sure that everybody had that back up just in case, you know, it was necessary. Now look, we also learned as we went, I mean for instance the first group we sent up, we did send a pack, but it was a pretty poor pack. The last group um, we deployed was sent up with a pack containing masses of really practical things that we'd learned over, the, over time they would need. Jan, you've got one more minute. Okay. I think don't minimise people's internal and external mechanisms because most people go back to reasonable functioning. Um, realise that um, people often have a need immediately post the event to minimise their own distress. Um, remember that we're visitors in affected communities and people's lives at a very sensitive and vulnerable time and be mindful of that. Try to quickly identify the established or emerging leaders in communities and in teams of helpers because they can be very useful to you um, in terms of identifying uh, community power dynamics and um, helping you avoid becoming embroiled in pitfalls. Don't forget that 
After the event as well as during, people need practical help and it isn't helpful for people to fight for months for resources to get back on their, field, on their feet. Um, check on the welfare of your teammates and other professionals. Um, that's a really important thing. And I can't stress how important it is to spend time engaging with others and establishing genuine respectful rapport. I mean, for instance, don't say to a traumatised flood victim, oh, it looks like rain. Be sensitive to what they've been through because our ability to do that clearly impacts on our ability con to conduct accurate assessments of need and to gain the trust of those we're trying to help. Uh, you don't want to be seen as a fly-by-nighter by communities, particularly by uh, rural and indigenous communities. And finally, I think I'd just like to say that despite the tragic circumstances, all the employees and myself found it to be an immensely rewarding experience. And I met some wonderful people at all levels of health that I'd never spoken to. I felt as if I was again doing what I'd entered social work to do, which was helping people. And I was immensely proud of the uh, response from all our staff. I hope that's the minute. <laughs> no, that's good. Thanks, Jan. You've already got some uh, comments from people watching, particularly a bushfire survivor from Kinglake who agrees wholeheartedly with what you've said in regard to the first response, saying it was vital. But we'll come back to questions for you at the end. Thank you very much for that. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce well, let's be honest, a higher life form, uh, a clinical psychologist with many years' experience in the assessment and treatment of mental health problems following trauma, Associate Professor David Forbes. He's the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health and Associate Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne and a Chair of the Working Parties for the Australian Guidelines for the Treatment of Adults with Acute Stress Disorder and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. David, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, overwhelming introduction, I might say. <laughs> um, and look, you know, to, just to kick off, I do want to endorse uh, what Jan has just gone through. You know, thank you very much, Jan. That's you know, very, very informative in terms of the, the role of your, personally and for your organisation through the disaster in Queensland, and to endorse um, all that you've, that you've spoken about, and perhaps we can discuss some of those details a little bit later on um, in the presentation. Um, look, I thought that um, to mix it up a bit, I would go through a few uh, kind of statements of principle, if you like. Um, so, so it's relation to kind of trauma, anxiety and grief responses more broadly, rather than necessarily being pegged to uh, disaster, but of course all of this does apply. And so these, these are principles perhaps where we can talk about how do they vary and how do they adapt in the context of specific events perhaps afterwards. So the first, the first point really is to reinforce something that uh, Jan had said really, which is that for us to be crystal clear that responses do vary. Um, they vary in terms of valence, so in terms of, we often uh, talk about terms like post-traumatic growth, so people can be negatively affected by these events, but they can also feel strengthened by these events. Um, but, they can, but those things can also coexist, it's not as though they exist as one or the other, that people can feel negatively affected and strengthened at the same time. The other thing to be thinking about is severity, that in fact responses vary considerably in terms of severity. For some people uh, the functioning and mental health effects are negligible, from others they kind of range through right up to the severe end of the spectrum. And they can range in duration as well, in terms of brief emotional effects through to long lasting or even unfortunately in a certain case it's kind of permanent effects. So I think the key part is that there isn't, exactly as Jan was saying, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all response to trauma, that it does vary on all of those dimensions. The key underpinning issue is that um, a minority of people will develop serious mental health problems. The vast majority will be affected but go on to recover in one form or another. So the issue then for us is kind of raises issues about screening and assessment and, and what, what do we know about what the key predictors are for those that are likely to develop uh, more significant mental health problems. You know, if these responses do vary, how do we know? What are some of those indicators for people that might develop more serious problems? And here we kind of think really in terms of pre-event predictors, kind of event-related predictors, and post-event factors as well. So I might just go through some of those very briefly, kind of remembering that this would be a very kind of brief principled uh, presentation. <coughs> Pre-existing vulnerability factors, so there, kind of history of exposure to prior trauma, 
history of mental health problems. But, look, but, but importantly, and, and I guess part of the good news is that the pre-existing vulnerability factors are, are smaller predictors than those that relate to the event or those that relate to after the event. So they're there, they're things that we need to be aware of in our assessments and in our screening process, but they're, but they're smaller predictors. The bigger predictors come in terms of exposure, specific factors, the nature of the exposure. Key things there are the degree to which, how predictable it was, how out of the blue it was, the degree of control the person felt they had during the event, the degree to which they felt that they or the, a family member's life was threatened, how long it went on for. So the, lot, the more of those kinds of indicators that were present as part of the event, perhaps the higher the risk. And I know here we're talking to some degree about natural disasters, but to go beyond that, we, we also know in relation to traumatic exposure that um, interpersonal trauma has a higher risk of, of mental health effects. Assault, particularly sexual assault, the highest risk of, of mental health effects. The other thing that relates to the event itself is the person's response. And here I've talked about peri-traumatic responses, the person's response during the event and post-traumatic response, which is their response in the aftermath. So the, some of the things we're looking out for in doing our screening and assessment is the degree to which the person may have had the higher risk types of peri-traumatic responses, which is dissociating during the event, feeling during the event as though time was slowing down or speeding up or they felt distanced from themselves, those kinds of more dissociative or felt numb, those kinds of more dissociative responses uh, raise our antenna a little bit about its impact on recovery. And also those that are particularly hyper aroused, particularly keyed up on edge where that just doesn't settle over the course of the aftermath of the event or the, or the days afterwards. So they're the two, some, perhaps two of the higher risk reactions that uh, we need to look out for in our screening and our assessment processes. And of course, you know, if we get, have post-traumatic responses that appear to persist with high levels of distress that persist for days or indeed weeks afterwards. Um, and post-event predictors, kind of ongoing life stresses, and as we know with disasters, disaster throws up not only the disaster, but a whole series of life stresses that the disaster throws up in the aftermath of having to negotiate all, all manner of issues. Um, but the other big predictor is social support. Now, in, our, in my view, really, that's really good news because social support is something that we can do something about. And in fact, social support is our biggest predictor of recovery. And if we're talking about um, significant uh, mass disaster, that includes not only personal social support, but also issues like community cohesiveness and support more broadly. If we're thinking about screening also, um, often we talk about screening for mental health problems like post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, very important is you know, often we gravitate to post-traumatic stress disorder because it is the disorder with post-traumatic in its title. But we do need to, one, understand that, uh, as we said, there's a whole variety of reactions that people can experience. We're looking out for kind of subclinical readjustment problems, but also other common post-traumatic mental health problems like depression, generalised anxiety, simple phobias, traumatic bereavement, and whilst I haven't got it there, also kind of substance use, escalation in substance use disorders also. So whilst post-traumatic stress disorder is a is, is a common mental health disorder one might experience in the aftermath of trauma, it's by no means the most common one. Indeed, depression would be the most common mental health disorder people might experience in the aftermath. So there were just some brief issues in terms of screening and assessment for us to be thinking about, and happy to talk about those in more detail later on. Um, in starting to think about intervention and levels of intervention, kind of reiterating what Jan had said earlier, that really we think about these things in three levels. And these are the three levels we thought about in Victoria in the aftermath of the bushfires, as well as we understand have been part of the Queensland health response. So the first level is ex as exactly as Jan was saying around psychological first aid. Uh, a that can be one-on-one -on -one as well as in the context of community development activities which I'll talk about further. Look, it is international consensus, psychological first aid. We also need to, to face that uh, we don't have a great deal of evidence to support its effectiveness at the moment. We know that routine psychological debriefing, as it used to be described in the, uh, historically, where routinely people are asked to, to, in the aftermath of an event, recount the details of those events. We know that uh, it's not optimal to be going through these events you know, using psychological debriefing routinely. Um, and that psychological first aid does take um, evidence-based principles of what we know helps, 
um, and applies those in the immediate aftermath. But having said that, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that we need to build a strong evidence base to the effectiveness of site first aid. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail shortly about that. Level two is really for those that don't respond to the early intervention around psychological first aid who continue to have mild to moderate readjustment problems. Um, a process that we've, we'll, we'll be describing a process around what we've called skills for psychological recovery um, to be delivered by primary care providers, general counsellors, and there's some moderate evidence around some of those interventions. And then specialist interventions for those that actually develop frank mental health disorders post disaster or post trauma. And there we're probably on the strongest ground in terms of the evidence base for, for interventions that we know work. In terms of psychological first aid, and, and again to reiterate what Jan had said, important is that it's tailored to individual need. It can be delivered. Um, by a range of people in the aftermath, it certainly doesn't need to be a mental health professional provided peer on peer uh, through uh, local community supports, general health supports, and mental health professionals also, but it's certainly not, not necessarily just the domain of mental health professionals. And really it's about kind of basic support and making initial contact and engaging with the person in the aftermath, <laughs> attending to their practical needs, key safety issues stabilising and, and dealing with any excess levels of arousal. Um, also attending to psychological needs, managing distress, providing coping strategies around managing distress. And critically, as we are saying before, providing education and assisting people with engaging in social supports. Again, um, and the, the finding around the importance of social support goes from disaster survivors, motor vehicle accident survivors, assault survivors, um, veterans and military personnel. Um, really this finding around the importance of social support really cuts across trauma exposed groups. So it's really something we can't emphasise enough. Having a look at the next level, and this is kind of a, a newer type of intervention, something we've called skills and psychological recovery. And it's, and it's a flexible intervention that was developed in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in the US. Um, and was really identifying those who, after the provision of psychological first aid, continue to experience mild to moderate readjustment problems. And you know that people in those contexts may attend for one session, a number of sessions. It may be in the counselling room. It may be out in the field. So a brief, flexible package where there was a quick assessment process, where the, where the process could drill as quickly as possible to the acute, most difficult presenting problem, and provide a use, useful intervention for that. And a, and a process that could be provided across the health spectrum with GPs, primary care providers, uh, general counsellors, welfare workers, really designed to be as flexible as possible in terms of who provides it and where it's provided. The kinds of interventions included in skills for psychological recovery are things that we know have good evidence bases from other areas of intervention. So things like providing problem solving skills, for example in the aftermath of disasters, disasters throw up a whole manner of problems for the individual to have to negotiate. So in certain circumstances it may well be that sharpening problem solving skills can be the most effective thing we can do to allow them to not only deal with the immediate problem they've got to solve but the raft of problems that are likely to unfold over the course of the weeks and months ahead. Um, activity scheduling, assisting the person potentially, re-establishing schedules where they can get a sense of control and routine back in the context of an event that's thrown off their routine. Uh, re uh, an intervention for re-establishing healthy connections and social supports, interventions for managing reactions, and also providing some assistance where people are stuck in their thinking, which is getting in the way of their readjustment. And certainly, again, skills for psychological recovery is something we used in Victoria in the aftermath of the bushfires. I also understand to be something that's going to be rolled out shortly across Queensland in the aftermath of the disasters. And finally, and, and I'm sure Mal will be talking about this in more detail shortly, um, the, the issue about evidence-based interventions for uh, frank mental health disorders that occur in the aftermath of these events. And it's, I guess it's important to not think of these things as necessarily phasic, where we provide PFA first, then we provide SPR, then we provide interventions for mental health disorders, because it may well be that for a small number of people they're developing quite severe acute mental health responses quite quickly. Um, and now we'll be talking shortly about um, you know, tertiary care and high level of care provided. 
But when we're talking about evidence-based interventions, critical is that we're talking about um, being able to provide these both psychological and pharmacological interventions for post-traumatic mental health disorders. And in the aftermath of a disaster, possibly a mass disaster, the idea about ensuring that there's uh, potentially considering a competency development program where practitioners may feel like they've got a good idea at how to address these um, difficulties, but may need some training in order to feel a bit more skilled and a bit more confident in providing these, these kinds of interventions to survivors. So they were the key principles I just wanted to talk about at this stage and happy to pick any of those up a bit later on. Outstanding. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's now my pleasure, last but not least, to introduce Associate Professor Malcolm Hopwood, who is a consultant psychiatrist and director of the Psychological Trauma Recovery Services at Austin Hospital. Now, he's been in the role of the director of PTRS, formerly the Veterans Psychiatric Unit, since... And uh, I'm very interested to see what you have to say, Malcolm. Over to you. Thanks, Michael, and hello to everyone. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here and uh, a lovely daunting challenge to follow a higher life form. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, what I'm going to focus on in my comments tonight is really looking at the group of people who do develop more severe problems following disaster, or, and indeed many of these comments would be germane to people who develop post-traumatic mental health problems from individual trauma as well. I think I want to commence by emphasising something David said, that we need to be very wary in our care of individuals post-disaster in making assumptions about what proportion will be affected in a, in a severe way in terms of their mental health. Um, out of, uh, I'm sure, most often a natural sympathy for the plight of those affected, it often leads to a, a sort of assumption that all individuals will develop a mental health problem and that's simply not true. We know that rates of the, the kind of symptoms David was talking about earlier are very common in the first week or two post-disaster, but that by one month the proportion of individuals affected will have decreased very significantly and there's a further drop over, over the following months. Uh, it, it, those comments are germane to a couple of questions I noticed popped up about separating out the symptoms of acute stress disorder from later post-traumatic mental health problems. Yes, I think the distinction is of some significance. What I'd generally be saying is that the role of mental health treatment in the first week or two isn't anywhere near as important as the other message, measures that make up psychological first aid. So unless someone's got very severe distress early on, the role of someone like me is all, in all likelihood fairly limited. Um, in that proportion who then go on to develop an enduring diagnosis, David's already mentioned that in fact post-traumatic stress disorder is not the commonest diagnosis. Um, there is again a natural tendency to lean towards that diagnosis, but it's important to, to practice our usual level of diagnostic precision after all, our evidence base is generally derived on the presence of a specific diagnosis with all the limits therein. The commonest major mental health diagnosis following disaster is in fact depression and probably the second most common is varying forms of anxiety that don't necessarily neatly fulfil full criteria for PTSD. David's already mentioned problems of substance abuse which we know, although sadly not uncommon in our communities as a baseline, certainly increased post-disaster and obviously the pattern of that substance abuse will depend upon the affected population and probably the age and gender mix of the population as well. I think an important thing to emphasise is that comorbidity is common. So if we talk about a rate of post-traumatic stress disorder following disaster and a rate of depression for example, it's important to acknowledge that many of those were the same people with two diagnoses. Um, so comorbidity in this setting is probably the rule rather than the exception. Um, you may notice that I haven't included traumatic bereavement in that list. Uh, I, currently that reflects to some degree our difficulties of knowing where that fits in our diagnostic hierarchy. Um, probably including both uh, where it fits in relation to other mood and anxiety disorders but also where the beginning and end of bereavement as a normal response and traumatic bereavement begins and ends. Um, 
A couple of comments about reflected in the fact that most individuals post-disaster will not have an enduring diagnosis. One of the things we need to be very careful of as an unintended artefact of our interventions is that we don't end up artificially defining people by their trauma. So many individuals in affected communities will say, yes, there was a terrible disaster in our community, I now wish to get on with my life. I think we need to be careful to observe and honour that and be careful of not by uh, unintentionally making a diagnosis that may not be terribly relevant, in fact make them feel further stigmatised for the future. Um, I've also noted a couple of questions that talk about the need for initial interventions to be culturally congruent for the affected community. Undoubtedly true, and that's equally true for the more significant mental health interventions. And I might come back to that in a moment. Um, if we then look at what are the symptoms of concern that if I'm involved in the response to a disaster should lead me to consider this individual might need a higher level of care. And obviously what constitutes a higher level of care depends on where you operate, but I suppose I'm generally talking about tertiary level care. Unfortunately, some of the um, enduring mental health diagnoses we see after disaster are associated with suicidal ideation and very rarely, but deeply concerningly, occasional completed suicide. In fact, we know of the anxiety disorders, at least some studies suggest, post-traumatic stress disorder is associated with the highest lifetime suicide risk. Um, we also know in assessing suicide risk generally that whilst we have often stressed the static factors in an individual's risk profile, such as a family history of suicide, dynamic factors are probably more significant in influencing suicide risk. These would include, for example, loss of home, loss of family members, loss of occupational role, many of the barriers that many individuals post-disaster will face. So we're talking about a high risk time. So if in doubt, for goodness sake, inquire about suicidal ideation and please assess carefully and then manage appropriately. Uh, I would add that these are issues that are of great concern to affected communities. So certainly our experience post-Victorian bushfires is that suicides within a community constituted a major re-traumatisation of many individuals in the community. Um, of course, depression and substance abuse are common in individuals post-trauma and the question may be, when is it sufficient that I need to consider a referral for a more intensive level of care? Well, obviously depression associated with suicidal ideation. But where substance abuse merges into dependence and detoxification will be required before intervention, or where either depression and or substance abuse, because they can co-occur, may be sufficient to impair that person's capacity to participate in psychological therapies such as exposure based CBT, other structured psychotherapies or even their capacity to participate in plain community recovery activities where they, where they impair that to a significant degree, maybe referral to a, a more intensive service might be indicated. One of the issues often confronting us post-disaster is, well that's great, where do I refer them to? So many disasters involve massive disruption of our usual health service systems. That might be as simple as the hospital that serviced this area is no longer there, the private psychiatrist who worked in this area is no longer there, the GP surgery is now out in the ocean um, or is now a heap of rubble, um, and the situation may be further complicated by the presence on the scene of a large number of caregivers. So one of the phenomena that's occasionally reported post-disaster is uh, the overburden of carers, individuals arriving at a scene desiring to be helpful, but in some ways often confusing our system's response. Um, there's no simple answer to this, but to acknowledge that our usual loci of care may be disrupted, um, in thinking about how to operate within that partially disrupted system, a couple of learnings from our Victorian response to bushfires might be relevant. Most people in disaster prone areas clearly prefer to have their services delivered locally. Um, so considering how can we re-establish systems of care within a local context, ideally with clinicians who are potentially familiar with that environment, 
or at least familiar with major consequences of disaster. Um, there's often a great dilemma about the capacity to have develop specific services to respond to the needs of people after disaster versus upskilling, if you like, more general mental health services. The reality after most disasters that there is that there will not be sufficient specific services to meet that need alone. So we need to do a combination of things, but particularly we need to think carefully about who needs intensive high level care. We need to use those resources most effectively. Thinking then about the sort of treatments that we might find relevant in major mental health uh, problems post-disaster. A couple of comments I want to make, and clearly it's beyond the scope of tonight to do a review of the entire evidence base around interventions um, for post-disaster mental health disorders. Um, what I would say is that we do now have a significant evidence base around disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression. What is clear is that that evidence base is very much focused around the discrete diagnostic categories and doesn't always take into account the comorbidities. Further, in the case of depression and to a lesser degree substance abuse, the uh, evidence base we have is generally not based on individuals affected by disaster. So for example, the pharmacotherapy of depression evidence base we have would almost routinely exclude people affected by disaster. So within those limits, what we do know is that pharmacotherapy may have a clear role in the treatment of depression and indeed of substance abuse, but the evidence is modest in circumstances like post-traumatic stress disorder. Generally for each of those conditions, the cornerstone of treatment, particularly for depression and PTSD, are going to be the newer antidepressants, the SSRIs and the SNRIs. Um, and there is an evidence base surrounding their use, particularly in depression and to a lesser degree PTSD. In the way I think about treatment for PTSD, a range of uh, stages may occur commencing with engagement, um, involving psychoeducation, involving arousal management, maybe involving pharmacotherapy and treatment of the comorbidities like depression and PTSD, uh, depression and substance abuse, I beg your pardon, with the ultimate aim of moving to exposure-based cognitive behavioural therapy wherever possible. So I think we see the treatment of severe PTSD as for some people a journey that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, I realise that constitutes a pretty inadequate summary of what's a vast evidence base, but I think it's important that we're all aware of the highlights of that evidence base and consider where our practice deviates from that evidence base, why it might be so. Thank you, Michael. Oh, outstanding. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate that. Um, in terms of uh, your last slide on referral systems, uh, did you want to speak to that? Oh, I see we're actually going to go through some of these. Yeah, uh, sorry, Michael, I got held up along the way. That's all right, not a problem. Okay, well, what we're now going to do, we have been besieged by questions, and I'd like to kick off for the whole panel uh, with the first one. Uh, I'm biased because as a child and adolescent psychologist, I'm very interested in um, how might these presentations vary in children and adolescents? And I'll start, if I may, with Jan. Um, we, yes, thank you. Um, I, th there obviously is uh, a, a difference in presentation. Um, I think we probably, um, if I could just say that um, screening tools are available. And for instance, we had a, a huge storm here that ran through the gap in Brisbane a few years ago. And screening tools were applied. And um, they found, you know, as we would expect, um, that there was a low level of ongoing, a long-term distress and anxiety amongst the children, uh, which wasn't being um, overtly expressed. So for instance, the teachers um, were feeling, oh, the kids are okay, they're coping all right because they just weren't you know, being able to express that. Um, and that was one of the things that we noticed also with um, kids going back to school um, through Toowoomba, Lockyer Valley, Lockyer Valley and so on. Um, I mean, there had been some terrible things, of course, because 
I mean, obviously people had died. Um, there were suicides and um, some, I, I won't go into it, but really some terrible things. Um, and the children knew about that. There was also some deaths of um, helpers, uh, emergency services and so on. So the children did know all that and found it very difficult, you know, to express that. So there was a lot of effort put in through our child and youth mental health services um, once things settled down to trying to get, you know, the kids to cope. Um, but it, with adults too, I mean, they, like I was saying, you know, they respond the way they live, you know. I mean, one of the things that we always felt, for instance, was that it was very difficult um, to, uh, to reach out to men, uh, particularly like country farmers and so on. Um, and you could have, you know, any number of services set up in, in a recovery centre, but, you know, like a truckie from Grantham is not going to go up to, and do forgive me here, but a psychiatrist sitting in a recovery centre and say, I feel a bit depressed, doc. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, so I think what you've got, uh, we really felt that what you needed was to have, uh, to be very careful how you offered help. And where possible, it should be preferably local and preferably, preferably without the mental health label because that really did put people off. You know, people constantly said, I'm not mad. You know, why are you sending out these people? I'm not mad. I've lost my house, you know. So there, there was a, a, a bit of a, in the beginning it was very much, um, oh, look, I'm okay, go to the person down the road, they've lost more than I have. Um, and then after a while that changed a bit and the communities became a little bit angrier about why should that person get, you know, this when I haven't sort of thing. So... Very, like I was saying before, varying stages and people respond varyingly, but I do think with children it was very much more difficult. Thanks very much. David? Uh, look, I'll, I'll predicate my comments by, by um, saying that I'm, I'm not a child and adolescent specialist, so I'll just predicate my comments with that first. But I, I guess the key thing to be thinking about is, you know, that the, obviously reactions will vary depending on what the developmental stage and age of the child is. Um, and that uh, we, we wouldn't necessarily be expecting two similar types of reactions. But in younger kids, we'd expect to see things like, if we were seeing reactions, you know, things like kind of withdrawal, irritability or tantrums, uh, possibly kind of other kind of ways of acting out or increase in um, uh, separation anxiety. Um, you know, and in older kids, we might start, as the kids kind of age, obviously, we'll start to see sim uh, symptoms that look more like we see in, in, in adults, really, where we'll start to uh, see things like irritability, anger, um, uh, people uh, being, kids, be, adolescents being kind of bothered by the memories of what's occurred, uh, kind of withdrawal behaviour, and kind of the kinds of depressive responses we might see in adults. Beautiful. Uh, David? Uh, it's, it's Mal here. Oh, Mal. Just, that's all right. Um, the, look, I... I I wouldn't have a lot to add to David's comments about presentations, but uh, would add the, the relatively non-symptom-like presentations that younger children may have brings up an interesting question about how they're going to be picked up in our service systems. So one of the areas we focused on in training post-Victorian bushfires was teachers, headmasters and other key community leaders who are going to have contact with kids. Um, mum and dad may pick up that their kids are distressed, but their behaviour at school may well be one of the greatest indicators of what's going on. So we devoted quite a lot of effort to that, and I think it's worthwhile. That was particularly useful in noting that in a severely affected community, any of the adults who are responsible for picking up a child's distress may, of course, be dealing with their own distress. Um, so if a child has confronted a traumatic experience, there's got to be a reasonably high possibility that mum and dad did as well. Um, so if we've informed their teachers and other key community leaders, the greater the chance that someone's going to pick up on their distress and seek appropriate assistance. All right, brilliant. Uh, look, I'll, I'll go to some of the questions from our uh, audience. One of them uh, related to whether media played a role in increasing post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, Jan? Um, 
I think it's a it's a bit of a balance, isn't it? Because you need to inform people, and um, the whole of Australia is interested in you know what's happening in areas like this and what they can do to help. But I think it can sometimes become um, news reports for their own sake, rather than it is something that's very helpful. And I know that. Um, People in our affected communities got very, very angry uh, with the number of um, media personnel uh, that were rushing around the place putting microphones and cameras in their faces. And um, I forget who it was, but somebody was talking before about the number of helpers that can descend on a community. And it was immense. You know, we had an organised response through government resources but then all sorts of other groups started coming in. So people would say to us, we've been door knocked and spoken to 50 times today. Would you please go away? I just want to get on with cleaning up my house. So um, I think continually, personally, the things that we were told, I think, um, that continually having the traumas um, in front of people can be very stressful for people and certainly that's what people were telling us, that they would just prefer you know, to get on with things and you sort of get to a, a critical point where you can get stuck in it, I think. Um, and it's so difficult and so stressful that you really do need to, um, once you've get over all of, got over all of that immediate sort of um, hideous shock, the pe people were telling us but we just want to get on. We don't want to keep seeing it repeated again and again and the same stories again and again. So we set, I think it's traumatising. Um, whether it does anything further, not sure. Thanks. Uh, David? Uh, look, just, just briefly to say, uh, so I guess a couple of things there that Jan raised. One was the uh, actual contact with the media and the continual contact with the media. And I think we do need to be conscious of trying to protect people in the immediate aftermath of trauma where they find themselves in situations where they're exposed to responding to the media in a time and a place that they're just not able to do so. So I think we do need to be cognizant of needing to protect people um, from exposure to the media in the early phases. Look, the other issue is um, the kind of exposure to media coverage. And you know, as we've seen now, we've, we can often have kind of 24-hour coverage. And I think that you know, whilst the media therefore you know, we would encourage people to get information from the media, and the media could be a tremendously important source of information. Having said that, we would be advising people to limit their exposure to the media, get information from the media, but then to give it a rest, and that to continually be exposing themselves to the 24-hour coverage can, can certainly not assist. I won't go as far as to say we've got strong evidence to say he's definitely harmful, but I'd be pretty confident he's not, in not assisting in their recovery. Yeah, and I guess that would be particularly true for very young children. Absolutely right. Okay. The parents do need to, to you know, assist, you know, to guard their children's exposure to the media, which can often come on in the middle of kids' shows on TV. Brilliant. Now? Yeah, Mark, I, I'd agree with David. I think it, it's an, an unfortunate thing, isn't it, that you can't just get the smooth, you get the rough and the smooth. So one of the great needs of communities in the first weeks post-disaster is information. And our mass media is a potentially magnificent organ for disseminating information, um, including, might I add, information about potential mental health consequences and pathways to care. I noticed one of the questions that's popped up was related to how do we destigmatise mental health care after disasters and indeed generally. And I'm sure one of the ways is through good media depiction. And I would generally say that if I think about the, the reception that mental health response post-disaster gets, it is on average better than it used to be. And I think part of that has been the, the use of the media for good at times. But it does unfortunately come with those intrusive risks and, and we all, you know, they don't need to be elaborated on, they're definitely there. Okay, while I've got you there, Another question is, when might inpatient care be considered? Yeah, just occasionally it is an issue that we need to think about post-disaster. Um, clearly, someone who's intensely suicidal would be one of those indications. We have a responsibility 
to keep people safe. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting that our responsibility to do that isn't any different post-disaster to other times, but our response to suicidal ideation is sometimes influenced by feeling like because they've been affected by a disaster, I couldn't do an assertive intervention like inpatient care. And I think we need to be just careful of that. Um, for those who develop substance dependence, um, inpatient detoxification can be useful. A third small group that I think it's really important not to forget about, disasters aren't selective in who they affect. And amongst the people they affect will be individuals with pre-existing serious mental health problems. So if you have schizophrenia and your dose set box is burnt in a fire along with your accommodation and the caseworker who came to visit you is preoccupied with many other things post-disaster, you're in a difficult spot. And they're a, they're a very vulnerable group, and one could extend that to other conditions, of course, that we need to not forget. The most poignant symbol I saw of that was about four days post-Hurricane Katrina. Most people will probably remember the images of people gathered around the football stadium in New Orleans, which is as close to a high point in New Orleans as they get. And on about the fourth day, there was a group of several hundred people gathered in the football stadium, all of whom, when you looked at them, looked a bit lost, looked a bit um, unfamiliar, didn't look well-dressed. They were, in fact, the residents of the local psychiatric hospital in New Orleans, which was built, surprise, surprise, in one of the lowest areas of New Orleans. Just a poignant demonstration of a group not to forget. Yeah, brilliant. Um, a very interesting question, um, I think, to consider. Do, do either of the other panellists have anything to add to that? Um, not to that, but am I, am I able to give a comment on the previous issue that was discussed? Of course. Um, and uh, I apologise, I seem to have lost my camera here, so I'll just press on if people can hear me. That's right, we can hear you of God, David. <laughs> Um, look, I just want to talk about the media, just to let people know, I think, about an organisation called the Dart Centre in Australia. And really, you know, the Dart Centre are doing some fantastic work in working with the media in terms of a responsible role for media in the con context of trauma and disaster. And that it's often, you know, often media are the first people on the scene in the aftermath of a disaster as well, and, and conscious of the degree to which uh, people in, within the media are themselves affected. So I just did want to talk about uh, the fact that uh, you know, the Dart Centre is doing some great work with the media, one in terms of how to assist journalists um, in the aftermath of these events and also about assisting them to develop standards and processes for supporting those who are affected themselves. Can I just add to that too? I think that um, that's some excellent comments because when I was talking before about needing to um, care for the carers, We've also got to remember that there are other systems that intersect with what we're actually doing um, in the disaster management. And part of that systematic approach to it is what's happening with the media. And uh, whereas, you know, we, send our, we were sending Queensland Health staff out who saw some pretty terrible things, uh, but they had a system of supports and debriefing and so on available to them. They also had a professional skill base behind them now, you know, journalists have their own professional skill base, but you know, maybe not um, the sorts of things that um, would support them through seeing some of the stuff that they had to see. So I think that although, the, and that's what I was saying before, it's a balance between what the media can very sensibly and usefully provide um, and looking after themselves as well. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, another question has come in about the limitations of CBT and what other structured psychotherapies might uh, prove useful. Uh, Jan? Um, I think I'm probably better to fling that over to our other two presenters. Okay, I was just being polite. Right. Uh, David? <laughs> sure. Uh, and can I just say I've not only lost my camera, I've lost my whole screen with the... Um, with the questions coming up as well. So if right. there is anyone listening to this who can come in and rescue me, that would be appreciated. <laughs> um, so look, in terms of CBT, look, um, uh, look, I will go out on a bit of a limb here and say that in relation to um, uh, disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, uh, panic disorder, um, 
simple phobias, the kinds of uh, disorders we might more likely see in the aftermath of trauma and disaster. Um, that, that, that CBT probably is one of the, um, is probably the paradigm with the strongest evidence base. So I, I wouldn't be saying for a minute that uh, CBT has a monopoly on the effectiveness of interventions, but it's probably one with the, with, with the strongest evidence base. But there are important other interventions like um, IPT, interpersonal therapy, developing a strong evidence base and some evidence base growing also for acceptance and commitment therapy that's uh, starting to generate some interest also. Um, but, I, but I probably would say that at the moment the strongest evidence base probably would be in the CBT area. But importantly, um, probably mainly because um, that's the area where there have been most investigations. And coming back to the principle of absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, um, that's not to say actually that other interventions aren't very effective. Um, it's that there probably haven't been as many kind of controlled trials as there have been in CBT. Okay, Mel. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd uh, support those comments entirely and just add a couple of things on top. I think what's terribly important is to think about an informed discussion with the person in front of you. So we share uh, a knowledge of an evidence base that of course most of the people who come to see us have no knowledge of whatsoever. And we clearly have a, a responsibility to discuss with them the relative merits and the relative weaknesses of all the treatments we can potentially provide. I think it's also important in many people post-disaster that discussion happens at a time when they're best placed to think through the issues involved. So for example, the individual who's currently homeless, penniless and not quite sure where the rest of their family is is probably not in a really great position to decide for themselves whether they wish to commit to CBT or act. Um, similarly, if they're currently suffering a severe depression or they're currently alcohol dependent, that's not a great time to either think about or commence such a therapy. So it's about um, appropriate education and discussion and appropriate timing. Can I just add something there too, quickly having said that I wouldn't, sorry. Um, I think that um, one of the things that we've noticed through looking at complex trauma treatment is that the process of uh, establishing, re-establishing and assessing meaning can, uh, really does positively affect um, somatic trauma symptoms, etc. And that that may actually aid effective processing of further cognitive behavioural interventions down the track. And I think we should remember too that Memory in relation to traumatic events isn't processed in the same way as ordinary painful but not traumatic events. Um, memory of a trauma is often broken, you know, bits of it are missing. Um, and I think that um, all the, the literature seems to suggest that healing from that sort of complex trauma happens independently from memory processing and probably doesn't have you know positive effect in treatment outcomes so that you know a lot of um, psychoeducating of clients regarding memory and trauma can be quite useful you know towards normalization yeah brilliant uh, David a question for you what if any instruments in terms of psychometric instruments would you recommend in the screening of for trauma um. So if we're talking about screening for trauma, so if we're talking about very brief screens, so there's a, there's a, a brief screen called kind of a, a screen for primary care, which is basically just four items, just trying to pick up uh, key, key groups of trauma symptoms. So that's a, it's called a primary care screen. Um, if we're talking about screening for PTSD more broadly, something like the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist um, is a useful screener. Um, public domain, um, good psychometric properties and if anyone wants to email me um, I'm happy to kind of send them the links to getting a copy of that. But important to say, remember again, that they're screeners for PTSD. Screening for mental health problems post-trauma more broadly, um, things like the K10 are kind of useful screeners for general mental distress, general mental and emotional distress. And that probably would be my first port of call, just screening for the level of distress. Um, um, and also starting to kind of identify what are some of those other risk areas that we spoke about earlier on. Mal, 
Yeah, look, I wouldn't add too much to that. I think there's clearly a balance in these matters of uh, feasibility of an instrument and they're appropriately well tailored. The only one I'd add to that to consider, never forget the substance abuse dimension, given that alcohol remains the commonest substance of abuse in our community. Um, the audit is a very simple scale that often yields surprisingly useful results in knowing just how much someone's drinking. Yeah, support the use of the audit completely. I think that's a great idea. Okay, we've got about four minutes left, so I'm going to ask for some very quick question, uh, quick answers. Uh, how does attachment theory inform current practice? Jan, was there an attempt to keep families together in Queensland? Oh yes, absolutely there was. Um, it, it, was uh, it was very, very important that we did do that and we really focused very much on trying to do it. The other thing too is that families came to the disaster with their previous issues. So we did also find um, that there were a number of child protection problems that surfaced and so on. So, you know, they had to be addressed too, but it was important to keep the families together. Okay. Uh, David, did you want to say anything about that? Oh, absolutely. Other than to, to, to reinforce that, um, maintaining the family integrity in the aftermath of trauma is critical, given what we're talking about, attachment and social support and fa familial support, uh, these things are absolutely critical and one of the most potent predictors we have in terms of ongoing development of difficulties or otherwise. Mal. And to echo that beware of the family whose attachments were poor prior to disaster. They're clearly an at-risk and vulnerable group, aren't they? Yes, it's a sobering thought to think that um, certainly if you believe uh, Pat McGorry, 20% of the Australian population already have a psychological problem, so that's certainly important to remember. We've got a message from a victim of crimes worker who spends uh, his or her uh, life listening to traumatic events. Uh, they're wondering, Jan, if you could give them any advice uh, on how they can cope with that other than supervision. Okay, um, supervision is a really important thing, but so is informal debriefing and to find somebody that you, can, you feel you can trust that you can just go and debrief with in a, a much more informal sense. Um, Self-care is very, very important. And I think one of the things that in the sexual assault field that, that we talk about a lot is getting um, workers to avoid seeing the picture of the abuse narrative. And it's, it, while it's, it's absolutely vital that the worker empathically and actively listens to the client's disclosure, they really should try not to visualise the traumatic event in their minds because it actually does get stuck very often. And um, you know, particularly in, in sexual assault, the sexual assault area, uh, where people are hearing the same things over and over again from their clients. So try not to um, see the picture in inverted commas. Um, I think um, that it's very important that the organisations that people work for are very aware of things like vicarious traumatisation, burnout and so on and that they have a lot of education about it. There's a whole pile of things we could talk about but it's certainly the, the self-care issue uh, and avoiding seeing the picture is a very important um, you know, way to go about. The other thing I should say is that you don't need to feel healed in order to live a happy, healthy, fulfilling sort of life. Um, and often as workers we want to fix the problem. Sometimes you can't fix the problem but you can help support people um, you know, to, to lead a, a healthier sort of life. And having that sort of more realistic goal um, I think is a very important thing in t when you're working in this sort of area as well. Thanks David. Any advice to our sexual um a victims of crime worker? Look, uh, to reiterate what Jan has said, but also, uh, you know, and self-care, supervision, a very important part of the picture. Look, the other part is that um, there, there probably is some value in not doing trauma-focused work, all of your clinical work. That the trying to actually um, have some variety and not doing uh, you know, trauma-focused work as, as, as all of your clinical work. The other part of it also is important is to say that even if even in times when your cases are all presenting with trauma-related problems, we're not necessarily engaging in the trauma-focused phase of therapy uh, throughout therapy. You know, that um, 
There's a lot of work we're doing around it. And when we're dealing with the trauma focus phase, it's done episodically as an episode of care. So as best as possible, there's some value in not doing the episode of trauma focus therapy for all the, all the clients at the same time. I think it is important that there is some balance and variety. Thank you. Mal, any, any comments on that one? Oh, just to add that it's a really important question and I think part of the importance of that question is that the capacity of this work to become overwhelming and to actually impact on the clinical care that you deliver. And that can be manifest in a whole lot of different ways from a sort of over-identification with the emotions of the person who's been traumatised um, through to a disengagement at the other end of the pole. So a self-awareness of how you're going in your own work and utilising all the measures recommended by others, really important. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Jan, I'll invite you to please uh, give us your final uh, three-minute reflection on uh, any of the major points you wanted to make about grief, trauma and anxiety. Okay, a few things. Um, first of all, systems don't always work. Uh, with the best will in the world, they don't. And you have to be flexible um, and you know, work within those. Um, always be aware of the people within the system and I think that it's very easy to, when everything's falling around, um, about around you, it's very easy to forget that we've got to care for others that are trying to do the helping, as well as care for the community. Um, I think the thing is, we need to um, remember very much that, um, particularly in a mass disaster, the first thing is an outreach role, and we must, all of us, learn how to do that. A multidisciplinary role is incredibly important. Um, I think that um, there's, uh, I, I think we've, my biggest message probably really is that most people get over it and go on. They may go on at a different level of functioning, but most people don't, you know, completely collapse. Some people do. And I think that's, I get very, very concerned that we might miss some of those, um, that end of line um, sort of situation with people. And I get very concerned about children within um, a disaster system. Uh, there's a lot we can do. Psychological first aid is an incredibly important thing. And um, I would very much like um, to have every member of Queensland Health, for instance, trained in psychological first aid or um, uh, anti-mortem interviewing, that sort of process. Um, I think probably they're the main things that I want to... Thank, thank you very much. Uh, David? Look, it's hard to know what I'd say in some that's different to what I've said so far, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but I think that, um, look, the key messages... I, I would really go back to the key messages, I think, which is that um, you know, in the aftermath of trauma and desire, disaster, you know, that um, there's no one-size-fits-all response. There's all, there's all kinds of different responses we see uh, that vary along all of those paradigms. And, and in terms of the timing of responses as well, for some people, they'll actually travel along OK and then there'll be a trigger down the track, an anniversary or a loss or some other event that occur, another stressful event that doesn't appear related and they'll experience difficulties. I guess the key part is that we have flexible interventions tailored to individuals uh, that provide people the care that they need when they need it. And that we also just keep monitoring and tracking people to be aware that in fact variations fluctuate over the course of time and that how people are presenting early on, um, it needs to, be, needs to be monitored and monitored with some of, the, some of the higher risk issues identified earlier. Thank you very much. Mel? Yeah, thanks Michael uh, and, and thank you for your chair again. And to MHPN, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting experience participating and I, I can't help but notice the level of interest the webinar has obviously attracted, um, which is fantastic from my point of view. And I, I sort of apologise on our mutual behalves. I can't help but notice all the great messages and questions we haven't dealt with that shows the level of interest there is in this area. Um, I, I think in echoing what the previous two have said, I think it's important to state that some of the principles we've been talking about are the result of enormous development in this area over the last 10 to 15 years. Disasters naturally bring out the desire in us to care and help people who have been affected by terrible things. 
But we now have a body of knowledge that tells us how to be helpful, when to be helpful, and also when to back off. And the ultimate goals of anything we do should be to assist people to recover, because most will, and to identify well those who don't, and direct them towards evidence-based care. And if we can participate as individuals in a system that helps do that, then we've probably achieved a good thing with our working day. Oh, that's just fantastic. What a good note to, uh, to end on. Uh, I'd like to thank all the, uh, the presenters, and of course I too am sorry that we couldn't get to all the questions. There were many, many more than we could handle, but that's okay because uh, you can continue uh, this interdisciplinary discussion uh, on the online forum on MHPN Online. I would ask all the uh, participants to complete the exit survey before they log out. And remember that you'll all be sent a link to all of the online resources that we've uh, discussed. Uh, and remember that the next webinar, Mental Health and Intellectual Disability, will be held on Tuesday the 14th of June 2011 at 6.30. Uh, and uh, of course, you can always go to the website for more information. So I'd just like to thank all the uh, people who have contributed to this, most especially Nikki and Tanya, who just do a most incredible job for MHPN. And uh, I thank you very much. I wish you all a very, very good night. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Are you still there, panel? Yes. I'm yes. Yes. Oh, well done. Just outstanding work. That was so interesting. Thank you. I'm so sorry about all my computer problems. I kept having major problems right the way through it. And I thought, right. Just imagine how good you'll be next time. Oh, I can't. It was incredibly interesting. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. Well, guys, thank you. I'm sure Nikki will be in touch to thank you uh, in, independently, but I hope you all have a great night, and thank you. Thank you very thank much, Mark. Much appreciated. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.